It is Tuesday, December 5th, 2017, and what new fresh hells and disasters are going to break out in this live feed? I can't tell you, but it is live and the Daily Dope is on the air. Hello again, I am Jeff McAleer, your host of The Daily Dope. I am the Grand Poobah of the GamingGang.com. And thanks so much for joining me on a windy, crazy windy Tuesday here in the Duct Tape Studios. And if uh, you're joining us for the first time, welcome aboard. Look forward to having some fun. We're going to talk about some news. Got a couple of unboxings that I'm going to do and uh, if you've been watching previously you'll notice a little bit of a change in the graphics I made this uh, window a little bit bigger so uh, I, there was some donation info down at the bottom that I never really set up and to be honest I'm not even gonna bother with it uh, for folks who who dig the gaming gang and the daily dope I will probably at some point have a link to our Patreon page down below, but I'm really not looking at like a Twitch tip system or anything like that. To me, it just, it doesn't make much sense. So anyway, uh, welcome aboard. It is Tuesday and I have loads and loads to cover today. I've got a lot of news. As I mentioned, I've got the two unboxings and uh, I have some other cool stuff to share with you as well. So first off, we should move on to our first news piece, and it is a good one. Yes, coming to our galaxy in 2018 is Robotech Force of Arms from my friends over at Solar Flare Games. That's right, the hit 1980s anime is going to receive the card game treatment. So here's the dope from Solar Flare, and there isn't a ton of info out there just yet. Robotech Force of Arms is a card game in which you take on the role of either the brave Robotech Defense Force, the RDF, or the warrior-like Zentradi. Hey, I can pronounce that because I was a big Robotech fan. Anyway, you and your opponent maneuver your fleets and launch your attack and defense forces trying to defeat the enemy's ships. Using heroes and distinctive commands at the right time can turn the tide of battle in your favor. Are you ready to defend Earth and the valiant Robotech Defense Forces? Or capture Earth and the SDF-1, they're known, otherwise known as Macross, or no, Macross Island, yeah, the Macross, Macross, yeah, duh. Or are you looking to capture the SDF-1 for the giant warlock, warlike Zentradi? Robotech Force of Arms is a tactical game of fleet movement and area control. You'll assume command of either the RDF or Zentradi fleet. On your turn, you'll move one of your capital ships, either into the open spot on the board or switching its location with another ship. Then you'll look at your fighters who have either a defense or attack value and you'll play two of them face down on your sides of the board with their attack or defensive values extending across the whole of the adjacent row or column. Attack fighters are used to destroy your opponent's ships and don't affect yours. That's strange, I, I'm reading teleprompter of course Something didn't look right about that. Anyway, defensive fighters defend your ships and have no effect on your opponent. Some of the fighters provide bonus tokens if played face up. After all the cards have been played, you and your opponent will alternate playing your tokens, adding attack or defense to your ships. Then you enter a phase that's called the hero in command phase. The person who had been going second will become the first player. Then you and your opponent 
gosh, you know what? I had a problem with the teleprompter the other day being too fast. Now it's just way too slow. Anyway, your opponent, you and your opponent will alternate playing cards and executing their effect from your hero and command cards until you've both played one hero and two commands. You'll then determine what ships you have saved, your defensive strength versus your opponent's attack, or destroyed, your attack strength versus your opponent's defense. Tied ships are not scored. Add up the victory points of all the ships you have saved and or destroyed. Player with the highest total wins. This is really a game that uh, has garnered a lot of interest, but I don't have a ton of details at the moment, as I mentioned before. I'm pretty sure this is just going to be a two-player game. There may be some expansions along the way. I don't know. I'll have to reach out to Dave over at Solar Flare to find out uh, exactly what might be going on uh, with this title. And uh, of course, once I know more, so will you. game but it is called 
Rajas of the Ganges. Hey, two more words I know how to pronounce. <laughs> In 16th century India, the powerful empire of the great Mongols rises between the Indus and the Ganges rivers, taking on uh, the role of Rajas and Ranis. Ranis? See, now there's a word I don't know. The country's influential nobles, players in Rajas of the Ganges, race against each other in support of the empire by developing their estates into wealthy and magnificent provinces. Players must use their dice wisely and carefully plot where to place their workers. Ah, so see, it's a worker placement game. While never underestimating the benefits of good karma. Of course, good karma is always great. Success will bring them great riches and fame in their quest to become legendary rulers. The box contains 48 dice, 24 workers, 4 province boards, 64 province tiles, 30 yield tiles, 20 cubes, 4 callies, 4 boats, 4 money markers, 4 fame markers, 4 bonus markers, 1 elephant, and it's an Indian elephant, not an African elephant, 8 river tiles, and a game board. The game is for 2-4 to four players, ages 12 and up, and plays in about 45 to 75 minutes. Now the MSRP on this is $49.99. And of course, you can learn more about that by going to R and R R N R <laughs> Games.com. Now, the next news piece I've got, I have to be honest, <laughs> yesterday was just such a disaster. I mean, it really was from starting an hour late because there was an audio issue due to a, uh, a Windows update that messed up everything I had set up uh, to just being completely discombobulated with everything. I mean, everything that was going on. So there was a, a big news piece. It's a game that loads and loads of people are super excited about. And I'm doing a news piece. And of course, not even thinking, I don't even change the screen. <laughs> So, I'm talking about this game, well, images from Conan the Mercenary from our friends over at Modifius Entertainment was up. So, complete disaster. So, I did want to share this news once again because this is a huge game. It's one of the most anticipated games of 2017 and it is arriving in stores now. And I mean now. There are people who are getting it and they are super excited. And as I mentioned, it is one of the most anticipated games in all of 2017. And it is Gloomhaven from Cephalo Fair Games, I believe is how it's pronounced. And it's a company I'm really completely unfamiliar with. This is one that, as I mentioned, a ton of people have been waiting for, and it's now available. And to my understanding, Gloomhaven's first print run essentially went out to Kickstarter backers and it was really difficult to find in stores. So the secondary market ate that up and I have seen copies of the game. And of course, I'm sure it's got, you know, Kickstarter uh, stretch goals and stuff like that, but I've seen it for over $400. I mean, that's, wow, that's pretty wacky. Anyway, now it's available at a much more reasonable price. And here's the dope from Cephla Fair. Gloomhaven is a game of Euro-inspired tactical combat in a persistent world of shifting motives. Players will take on the role of a wandering adventurer with their own special set of skills and their own reasons for traveling to this dark corner of the world. It strikes me as another kind of uh, GM-less role-playing game, which are really big right now and pretty cool. Players must work, to get, well, must work together out of necessity to clear out menacing dungeons and forgotten ruins. In the process, they'll enhance their abilities with experience and loot, discover new locations to explore and plunder, I love plundering, and expand an ever-branching story fueled by the decisions they make. This is a game with a persistent and changing world that is ideally played over many game sessions. So that's pretty cool too. It's it's like a legacy game. 
After a scenario, players will make decisions on what to do, which will determine how the story continues, kind of like a choose your own adventure book. Sweet. I always dug those <laughs> as a kid. I got my nephew Cameron into those now, into the old ones that are like open source. Anyway, playing through a scenario is a cooperative affair where players will fight against automated monsters using an innovative card system to determine the order of play and what a player does on their turn. Each turn, a player chooses two cards to play out of their hand. The number on the top card determines their initiative for the round. Each card also has a top and bottom power. And when it's a player's turn in the initiative order, they determine whether to use the top power of one card and the bottom power of the other, or obviously enough, vice versa. Players must be careful though, because over time, they'll permanently lose cards from their hands. If they take too long to clear a dungeon, they may end up exhausted. I'm so tired. And be forced to retreat. Gloomhaven is for one to four players. Sweet. I always love solitaire games or games I can play solitaire. Ages 14 and up plays in between 30 minutes to two hours. That's a pretty good stretch of time. And it does carry an MSRP of $120. Now I should point out, you really should check out the Seth LaFere website because I've found it to be a pretty interesting read. I think I'm going to reach out to Isaac, just say hello, you know, try to you know make sure that uh, anything new coming out from them we cover, make sure we get the stuff out there. But uh, I do notice that there's a blog on there and it's not just about twisting your arm to buy the game. It seems to me that Isaac and uh, Seth LaFair overall uh, are very, very transparent. And it strikes me that Gloomhaven was, uh, was a real labor of love and that has done extremely well from, uh, I should say, for Seth LaFair. Anyway, but uh, I did want to get that news back out. If, as you can see, uh, there's some pretty cool images. I would have shared a video for this, but really the video that was from, because this is the second printing, the video that was out there was only like, I don't know, about a minute long uh, that was on their, their previous Kickstarter. And it was just like all these blurbs from reviewers and stuff. So it really didn't share anything. But uh, the box is huge. I mean, I don't, I, I haven't seen it up close and personal. But from what I can tell in the photos and that, I mean, the box looks like it's it's like this deep. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty big and it looks like it's jam packed. So hopefully I can maybe run across and check that out because I I really dig those GMless uh, excuse me like role playing board games, uh, Sword and Sorcery from Ares, which uh, I'm going to show off on the show because I didn't really uh, when I transitioned from just doing the videos to the new the daily dope uh i didn't really have like a review video for sword and sorcery so i'm going to do that i think i'm going to do that la next week um because it, it's going to take up a lot of space over here anyway and it's going to take some time to set up but uh and then of course there's folklore which uh from my friends over at greenbrier games which is awesome but anyway that was a news piece about gloomhavens <laughs> so be looking at gloomhaven cephalophare <laughs> check them out Anyway, next up, I have a news piece from my good friends over at GMT, some of my favorite people in the gaming industry. And you'll find out uh, one of the reasons why in just a couple of minutes. Anyway, now available from my friends at GMT is Chad Jensen's Welcome to Centerville. And I do apologize. I wish I had more photos for Welcome to Centerville because it looks pretty cool and it's Chad Jensen, so you know it's gonna be good. Anyway, Welcome to Centerville is a fast playing board game for two to four players. Welcome to Centerville abstractly models the growth and management of a small city, perhaps not unlike the one you're in right now. I'm outside Chicago, that ain't no small city. 
Anyway, players act as entrepreneurs, tycoons, politicians, hey, politicians, and other local movers and shakers working to develop a modern urban area. Fortunes will be made and fame will rise. I wonder if fortunes can be lost. Hmm, don't know. As time goes by, personal milestones will enrich the players even further. Throughout the game, players will roll six dice, keeping some and re-rolling others, then implementing the various die faces on the game board. This will result in political offices gained and lost, new vocations learned, acquisition of new land, or the erecting of new buildings. The end result will be a vibrant community that is re revered. Ha, <laughs> yeah, ha, <laughs> ha, revered. Not Paul revered, revered. Near and wide, but only the player who has best balanced his wealth and privilege will emerge the final victor. To go into a little bit more detail about the game, because we don't have too many images, the board comprises four quadrants of play. The town proper, the political offices, the available vocations, and the surrounding green belt, much different than the Bible belt, or the rust belt. On his turn, a player rolls six dice, setting aside all, some, or none, while re-rolling the rest up to a total of three rolls, then implements the results of the dice in the different areas on the board. Each area offers the players opportunities to score wealth and privilege. I like being privileged in various ways. Time moves onward out of the control of the builders of this small community. community. Small community, Jeff. An hourglass icon on a die moves the round marker one space up time track. An hourglass can't be re-rolled, but that player gains a compensator... Yeah, compensatory milestone, which can be used during one of the three scoring rounds in the game. The town quadrant is further divided into four colored zones and a central park space, which we just saw the map pop by or the board pop by. So we saw that. Two of the colored zones generate wealth, the other two prestige. Construction icons on the dice are used to construct buildings in town. Buildings range in value from one to three points, and the player or players with the greatest total value in a zone gains the wealth or prestige during scoring rounds. Control of the Central Park provides a player with plus one value in each of the four town zones. The park bench icon found on the green die is used to take control of the central park. Okay, uh, a little more detail than we probably needed, but in the green belt, quadrant players accumulate potential investment by proceeding along a numbered track, but will only score for those investments if they also have developments in the field and or lake spaces. Each tree icon on a die can be used to move forward along the green belt track. Three trees combined are used to create a field or lake development. See, I was waiting for the teleprompter to, to catch up. It's always one or another thing, right? It's either the teleprompter's too fast or too slow. Anyway, vote icons on the dice allow a player access to the political offices. <laughs> Outvoting an opponent will oust them from an office as you take it over. When acquired during play, each office provides a unique minor bonus. During scoring rounds, politics will generate both wealth and prestige. <laughs> yeah, of course they do. For players who hold multiple offices. A player devoid of political offices during scoring will lose wealth and prestige. In the final quadrant, six random vocation tiles are available to choose from each turn. Well, supplies last. Rolling the education icons allows a player to take one or more vocation tiles. Collecting different vocations will score a player wealth. Collecting sets of the same will gain the player prestige. So it's all about wealth and prestige. The playouts can be lucrative, but unlike 
the other board areas vocations are only assessed during the third and final round scoring round i should say fate as always has a hand in man's affairs rolling a fate icon on a die allows a player to add that die to a different icon to increase its value alternatively two fate paired together can be used for a modest gain in wealth or prestige while four fate can presage a disaster for your opponents and there is like way more information in this than i originally thought i was popping in scoring is performed at the end of each of three rounds of play the offices town and green belt score every round locations only during the final round collected milestones may be converted to either wealth or prestige when all is said and done, each player assesses where his wealth and prestige markers are on the scoring track. The lower the two is his final score. Hmm, interesting. So careful consideration between balancing wealth and prestige throughout the game is vital to a winning strategy. I believe that's it. Yes. Welcome to Centerville plays in approximately 20 minutes per player. So of course, adding more players is going to really add a little bit more time to the game. It's best with four from what I hear, but it is for two to four players ages 14 and up. And you can get it right now at your friendly local game store or from our friends over at gmtgames.com for 59 95. Whew, man, that was a super long piece. Uh, I didn't remember it being that long when I, when I popped it into the news here. But it does look pretty neat. And I'll have, as if I haven't said enough about Welcome to Centerville, I'll have something to show you in just a few minutes. Anyway, I do want to mention if uh, you were following the show last week, uh, Cubicle 7 Entertainment announced that they were no longer, uh, they weren't, they weren't working with Chaosium Publishing anymore for Call of Cthulhu and that uh, the license wasn't going to be renewed and uh, it looked like it was uh, pretty much just a mutual decision which I knew about back in August, but I know how to keep a secret when people tell me stuff off the record. I don't say anything. But of course, I figured what we were going to see is exactly what Cubicle 7 announced today. There is a big sale for Cubicle 7 Entertainment products that are built for Call of Cthulhu. And if you're not familiar with how licenses work in the gaming industry, and we've seen this before with like, say, Fantasy Flight, Fantasy Flight games, um, they decide they're not going to continue with a certain license. Well, what that means is when that license ends, that company can no longer sell that product. Now, game stores can if they have it in stock, but once it's out of stock, it's gone. So right now, Cubicle 7 has uh, quite a lot of their uh, Call of Cthulhu lineup on sale. And uh, here's the dope from Cubicle 7 itself. My my buddies, Dominic and John and the rest of the gang. I, you see, I do Cubicle 7 news because I really dig Cubicle 7. On January 1st, 2018, we will take all of our current licensed Call of Cthulhu products off sale permanently. They will not be sold by Cubicle 7 after that date. Before January 1st, we're reducing the price on almost all of our Call of Cthulhu licensed game titles. These are World War Cthulhu, Cold War, World War Cthulhu, The Darkest Hour, The Laundry, and Cthulhu Britannica. So those are a lot of supplements that are in those lines too. You may see some of these fine games in your local game store for a month or two, 
but there will be no restocks available. As they sell out, they will not be replenished, as I already mentioned. These games will not be reprinted or republished by Cubicle 7 in their current form using the Call of Cthulhu rules. Currently, our plan is to reboot these lines with a new system or systems. Can't wait to see what they come up with. It is a little too early in that process to confirm any more details with regard to the potential for backwards compatibility. We're exploring a lot of exciting options right now, and we will keep you posted on our website, newsletter, and social media. Because some of these titles are newly released and pre-orders have been only open a short time, we will not be discounting those titles out of respect for our customers who pre-ordered, because of course they've already been charged, or kickstarted those titles, because once again, they've already been charged. A huge thank you to those customers. We really appreciate your support. Hey, and I appreciate you guys too, Cubicle 7. We hope you have enjoyed our Call of Cthulhu settings and supplements. We certainly had a great time working on them. Gotta say, this is some big news, and there's some really big savings here, folks. Uh, from what I've seen, and of course you're, you're watching some of the images of some of the different products that are out there for uh, Call of Cthulhu from Cubicle 7, they're starting off with a 25% discount. So I know there are some that uh, are like print and PDF together. And once again, those are also being discounted. If uh, you don't necessarily want to have to order and have things shipped over from across the pond, I do have to point out that uh, you, you're not going to see these kind of discounts at your, your local game store. I would say, though, keep your eyes peeled if, if you're a big fan of, of PDF books like I am. Uh, I love to load a bunch of them up on my iPad Air and uh, as opposed to, you know, lugging around a huge stack of, of RPG books. Keep your eyes peeled because we may see something pop up as far as like drive through RPG. So if that does arise before uh, the new year, I will, of course, bring that news to you as well. And speaking of drive through RPG, I do want to mention if you're, you're new to the show, The Daily Dope is part of The Gaming Gang. Uh, so the website is thegaminggang.com. We are an affiliate to drive through RPG. So if you happen to go to thegaminggang.com and click on one of our banners for drive -thru, any of the drive through sites, really, and you make a purchase, we get a little sliver of that sale, which you'd be surprised. Those little slivers add up. So just to let you know, but for Cubicle 7 fans and Call of Cthulhu fans, I gotta say, C7 did some amazing stuff, fantastic stuff for C of C, as we like to refer to it. Some people call it COC, but we always call it C of C. So get out there, take a peek, go over to their website and check it out. And then in my final news piece of the day, since it's Tuesday, tomorrow's new comic book day, and this is not simply all about gaming all the time, I did want to mention that Dynamite Comics is launching a brand new series that is one to watch. And uh, I believe it's uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty popular. And yes, that is... Barbarella. It's a new series based on the classic sci-fi heroine's adventures. And of course, this isn't just a rehash of the movie starring Jane Fonda either. Time to coincide with the celebration of legendary heroine Barbarella's 55th anniversary. Can you believe it? 55 years? Dynamite Entertainment is pleased to announce that the iconic character's first ever American comic series and first new comic series in more than 35 years is now set to feature the critically acclaimed artistic stylings of Turkish artist Kenan Yarar. I'm guessing, I'm gonna guess. Yarar joins writer Mike Carey 
famous for the X-Men, Lucifer, the girl with all the gifts, and longtime Barbarella brand custodian and consulting en uh, editor, Jean-Marc Lofficer, guessing on that one too, on the revolutionary new series slated to release tomorrow. When I was first told of Dynamite editor Matt Idelson's Barbarella project, I thought it was fascinating, says artist Keenan Yarar. Even though Barbarella is unruly, bold, attractive, and sexually appealing, she wasn't objectified, and she has a strange universe that may lead to countless eccentric worlds. The thing that compelled me to absolutely take part in this project was reading Mike Carey's script. The script was masterful and enjoyable in addition to having a solid philosophy and subtext to be the answer if someone bothered to ask me what kind of a comic book I'd like to work on as an artist. Also, the script demanded costumes, weapons, ships, and worlds to be redesigned. The kind of work I delight in. I hope to present the script and Barbarella to Dynamite readers as fine and sophisticated as they truly are. Another quote, or series of quotes, we are extremely proud to not only be the first publisher to bring the iconic character back to print in more than 35 years, but to be the premier American publisher to have the honor in Barbarella's history, says Dynamite CEO slash publisher Nick Barucci. To be able to work together with the incredible talents of Mike Carey, now combined with the artistic brilliance of Keenan Yarar, swear I'm hoping I'm getting that right, we're certain we've brought in the perfect team to do her legacy justice. I cannot thank Jean-Marc and the estate enough for bestowing this honor on us. So in comic book stores tomorrow, 32 pages in glorious color comes Barbarella and it is $3.99. I have to point out, because I was kind of late to the show as far as Dynamite just recently added the gaming gang as uh, reviewers, I haven't seen the first issue. But I will point out that it is for mature readers. So, I mean, take that as it comes. It's for mature readers. And if you saw the original film with Jane Fonda, you'll understand why. So that is the news for today. Uh, and uh, I've got a lot of stuff cooking, a lot of things going on today. Got to work on that teleprompter. That teleprompter today was just too slow. <laughs> and then I decided. So anyway, I had mentioned before, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of uh, images to use for the Welcome to Centerville title from Chad Jensen and uh, GMT Games. And I do want to toss out uh, a shout to Kai Jensen. Uh, I believe that's how her name is pronounced. Chad's wife, she does like all the game development on his titles. And if you're not familiar with Chad Jensen, he's done um, Dominant Species, Urban Sprawl, uh, Combat Commander, <laughs> which is sort of like, whoa, wait a second. What, those, those are kind of, the first two are kind of Euro-y and then the third is, but awesome games, all awesome games. He's done some other titles too. So anyway, so uh, I wish I had some more images to share with you. But the funny thing is, as I was putting together the news this morning, I get a delivery. And I swear, GMT is the best. These guys are great. Gene and Tony and the rest of the gang over at GMT Games. And all of their games aren't war games either. I mean, a lot of people look at GMT and they think, ah, it's war games, it's all war games. No, there's, the majority are war games, but there are quite a few that are not war games. Like, say for an example, <laughs> welcome to Centerville, baby. 
So, huh, I didn't have any images. Hey, let's try to make sure that we don't, uh, let's try it this side. Let's, uh, I keep forgetting I kind of made this bigger. Try to keep uh, some of the glare off it. There we go. So we got what? Welcome to Centerville, right? So anyway, so I get this box. This box is jam-packed with goodness. It is jam-packed with GMT goodness. So, all right, so we got Welcome to Centerville. Then we've got, oh my gosh, this one is, is really heavy. Guilford Saratoga brandy wine. Look at, look at that. I mean, this is uh, this is really a seriously big box, and it's heavy too. It's this isn't light. It was funny because when I grabbed the box, I I didn't look right away to see who who it was, what the publisher was. When I when I picked it up and it was really heavy, I'm like, oh, it's got to be GMT. Then we got next war poll and. Just it, the hits just keep coming, man. Next War Poland. Uh, War Game Wednesdays, we are going to be jam packed with unboxing and that uh, for for a while. Then, uh, another, oh, geez, I almost dropped it. It's so heavy. Here I stand. And I believe this one, this is, uh, this is, of course, the, this is the new edition. This has been out, this was out previously. Uh, I swear I've got a review of it up. I know I've got a review of it up. I don't believe I ever did an unboxing for it. I think I may have reviewed this before I started doing any sorts of videos. So I, uh, I'm going to do an unboxing for this. And of course, it's going to be live on the show. So I'm going to do an unboxing and I might even do a giveaway. I don't know. What we'll to see. Don't know. I want to try to do some giveaways try to i'm working with some companies a little swag a little fun some fun stuff so i've got that and then i was super excited another big heavy box wild blue yonder is out wild blue yonder I, okay so i have not played wild blue yonder and let me i'm going to turn this around and then i'm going to block my face off so you can see this box and see there we go kind of move it a little bit there you go Okay, got, got a quick story about Wild Blue Yonder. So I'm in, uh, I live in Arizona at the time, and I lived in Arizona in, the, in Mesa when I first launched the gaming gang. I'm originally, I was born and raised in Chicago, in the city of Chicago. But so anyway, so I was living out in Arizona for uh, God, about seven years. So Con Sim World Expo is a convention every spring. Which, of course, spring in Arizona is like the surface of the sun everywhere else. Anyway, so they do, uh, it's a wargaming convention. I mean, and we're talking serious grognards. You have people there who will bust out these big, epic, like old, old games that they play. I think, I want to say the convention runs like five days. They'll have that game set up on a table for five games. Or five games, duh, five days. And what they do is they actually produce these huge maps. So it's these big tables. So anyway, regardless. So I am there at uh, Constant World and I'm hanging out with uh, some of my buddies from Victory Point Games at the time. So there's uh, Herman Lutman, Steve Carey, Lance McMillan, uh, my good pal, John Welsh, and uh, Alan Emmerich. I mean, I wasn't really hanging with Alan, but, you know, chatting with him and stuff like that. And I can't remember who asked me if I had ever played Down in Flames, which is from Dan Verson Games. And uh, I was like, no, I, I, no, I haven't played it. And they said, oh, man, it's a lot of fun. You really got to get in. They're having a tournament. It's just a pickup tournament. They'll, they'll teach you how to play. And what it is, is each player is going to have uh, their fighter and then like a wingman. And uh, it's, it's super cool. I mean, it's not, it's not super difficult to learn how to play. I mean, there were, there were young kids who were actually playing in this tournament too. So I am super, super pumped to, uh, to see that Wild Blue Yonder has finally come out. So, uh, man, I am just so excited. Like I said, 
love GMT. They always have such awesome stuff. But anyway, so today, uh, as I stretch out a little bit, I don't have to worry about the teleprompter anymore, so it's just us chatting. <laughs> yeah, keep in mind, uh, if you you haven't watched this yet, I mean, this is new. We, aren't, we haven't even finished up our first week. But I will want to point out that uh, if uh, you're just tuning in for the first time and you think this, it's just going to be games, 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 without opinions or anything like that, well, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, so there we go. I've got a couple unboxings to do today. And let me pop over here, turn the old camera off. Uh, one thing, I, before I jump into this, one thing I will mention, uh, like I said, I made a few little tweaks. So this main screen is a bit bigger. I apologize if I'm not like super, super clear. I, I really only have two cameras I can I can utilize right now. I have another camera, which is really good. I just don't have anything to capture that with. You got to realize this is all being done shoestring budget. <laughs> I do not do like big Kickstarters and stuff like that to keep the gaming gang afloat. So I got to work with what I can. So I want to make sure that uh, when I'm showing off games and stuff, that that is what actually has, you know, the best view. So anyway, so today I'm going to take a look at two games from Osprey Publishing, from Osprey Games, that uh, that arrived just the other day. I was only going to do one today. I was only going to do, oh man, here we go. Here, here comes Jeff completely botching this pronunciation. The Ravens, I'm going to try it this way. The Ravens of Three Sahashri. Sounds kind of, I don't know, maybe close. The Ravens of Three Sahashri. Okay, and um, I've heard really good things about this. It is a two-player game. It's a cooperative card game. And it's, I, I hear it's kind of, kind of, puzzle-ish so which is kind of cool a lot of euro gamers kind of dig that kind of stuff i like good kind of puzzle games i don't like games that that are a puzzle so i've got this and i really 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 wanted to do the unboxing for the lost expedition because i really want to play it <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I don't want to play Ravens. And that's what I'm going to call it for short. I'm just going to call it Ravens for short. But I was super excited that the Lost Expedition was included in that really sweet package from Osprey Games. So we got some time. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, trying to do the show about 90 minutes or so. So uh, let's take a look at Ravens first. And we'll move this out of the way. Move the Lost Expedition out of the way. I am probably going to have to resort to ye old reading glasses. Because I'm going to take a guess the print might be kind of small. And I turned 50 in October. <laughs> so, just comes with the territory, baby. Just comes with the territory. Thankfully, I don't have to use these very often. Uh, about the only time I really have to bust them out, uh, for an example, who... Who out there, I know this is silly for me to ask it this way. Who out there has played uh, Race for the Galaxy? Those cards would make you go blind, right? I mean, they're tiny. I remember I was at uh, my friend Louis, uh, my friend Louis's house out in uh, Phoenix on Tempe. I want to say he lives in Tempe. And I know where he lives. I'm just trying to remember if it's Mesa or Tempe because it's right on the border. Anyway, uh, so we're playing some games with him and his family. And uh, he goes, hey, man, you want to play Race for the Galaxy? And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll just watch. You guys go ahead and play. And it was because I didn't have reading glasses with. <laughs> I'm like, I can't play it without being able to read the cards. Okay, so enough of me rambling on. 
Okay, so the Ravens. <laughs> I am going to uh, take my, as you can see, it's, I mean, th this is a real unboxing, folks. Uh, sometimes if the shrink just per has way, way too much glare, I'll take the shrink wrap off of the game. But even from the videos previously when it's unboxing, th these really are unboxing videos. I, I don't know much about the games. In fact, I kind of get a kick out of knowing as little as I possibly can about the game before I crack it open. All right, so uh, I'm just going to use this little hobby knife to kind of get into this. And of course, those at home, be careful. Be careful if you're using scissors and things like that to, to get the plastic off. Uh, I know I mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, how doing unboxing videos and stuff how I would have to sit there and screw around try to get the plastic off of uh, a lot of the cards ah look oh hey they're oversized cards too all right what we got going on well this is kind of a nice presentation if I could pull this out there we go okay so here's the rule book there we go then got these oversized kind of tarot cards. So my understanding, oh, these kind of squeezed in here. Is there something? <laughs> Whoops. Oh, wait, there's little envelopes. Okay, I'm not going to crack those open because they've got little stickers on them. They're sealed. So there may be some sort of a reveal. So I don't want to crack that open. Okay, so we've got the cards. And as we can see, the artwork has a very uh, manga flavor to it. Anime sort of flavor. Of course, the reason behind that is because the game is designed by Kuro. Yes, even, even I will probably be mispronouncing this name. It's four letters, and I bet you I got it wrong. But I'm going to say Kuro. So my understanding is that the game is... This young girl, I don't I don't know for certain if it's... Uh, she's heartbroken over a lost love or something like that, but... Um, I believe she's being overwhelmed in her sadness and kind of kind of interesting. You know what? Let's read the back of the box. I don't necessarily like like reading backs of boxes because it's kind of goofy, but all right. Trapped in the prison of her own mind, Ren has only one chance at survival. Her psychic friend, Feth, must reach into her unconscious to help guide her home in this cooperative card game. One player controls the deck of memories, while the other can communicate only through the placement of cards. Only by working together can they save Ren before the ravens come to feast on her heartbreak and devour her memories whole. Okay, yep, yeah, see? Includes 42 oversized cards, a rule sheet, and three sealed envelopes. So we're not going to crack open these envelopes. Although, wouldn't that sort of mean that you're only going to end up playing this three times? I don't know. Okay, so let's take a look at the rules. And this is a pretty small rule book. So I'm going to kind of get it up here. So we got a little bit of flavor text, which of course is going to tell me the story about why she's sad got the components so we've got the rule book two character cards 35 memory cards five raven cards three sealed visions of the future so we're going to see there's the setup area so it looks like we've got a, a memory row there's feth here's the deck here's your discards huh. score pile that's ren and poem rows So there's a bit of an overview of the game. 
talking about the memory cards. It shows value, color, faded memory, ability, clear memory. Oh, so if you notice, sort of like those are clear, but these are kind of faded out. You can still sort of make out something of the image. Dreams beginning. This looks pretty unusual. Okay, so we've got Feth's turn. The Atman? Huh. Cuckoo Kachoo. The Atman! I am the Atman! Reliving memories? Oh. So I, I'm taking a guess. Maybe you, you want to try to match up some of these cards that complete each other. So, for an example, we see this half of that card is uh, like a faded memory, and that half of that card is a fate, faded memory, and then together. Huh, interesting. And we've got Ren's turn. So it looks like Ren is trying to complete a poem. Hmm. Cards in the poem. Splitting the Atman. Card abilities. Dream's end. The final dream. Losing the game. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be doing enough of that. Winning the game. Ah, okay. So it says um, winning the game. Uh, if Ren survives all three dreams, the player... I'm sorry. The players have done extremely well and should be proud of their achievement. The Ravens have been defeated, and Ren's life has been saved. As they begin to wake, Feth has a vision of the future. It says that's when you'll open envelope one. What's behind door number one? A brand new car! And here's an order of play. List of card abilities and frequently asked questions. All right, so... You know, that's, uh, those are quite a, quite a few rules in here. Really, what, 24 pages? I mean, granted, it's kind of a small book, but that's quite a lot going on for a little card game. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are not going to look around at these envelopes. I'm not into spoilers. So let's see. Looks as if, there we go. That's gonna change that up a little bit. Maybe. Hmm. Ah, so all these cards are gonna, these are all gonna come out of one deck, I guess. So should I take a guess that these cards are maybe Ren and Feth? Why, sure enough, they certainly are. Let's see what we got. I see different values for these as well. Oops. So these these are the memory cards. And then if you you see each of the cards will have some sort of ability too. It says one card under the next card placed counts as the same color. Rotate the next card 180 degrees before placing it in the Atman. Atman. Okay, so. Got the different colors. The safety area is increased by two spaces this turn. All right. Hmm. Interesting. I can see where uh, people are talking about, well, there's kind of, it's kind of a puzzle. Well, yeah, obviously you're trying to match up these missing pieces together. I suppose that is a puzzling aspect of the game. Okay. Oh, there's a blue one. Ah, okay, so here are the ravens. 
So there are five. When a card of this color is discarded, place it beneath the raven instead. I don't know if these ravens begin in play or if they might appear at a certain point. I'm not really sure. Can't tell you. Because I haven't played the game. Haven't read the rules either. But uh, I like these oversized cards and the stock is nice. Not cheap and crappy. So, uh, cool. I would think this is, uh, this is a title that would appeal to fans of, well, of course, probably, you know, manga and a anime fans, but I would think that this would appeal to folks who, uh, who like lighter Eurofare and, um, enjoy, like, a puzzle aspect to games, obviously. So let's put this stuff back in. And I do like the... This is a really nice, solid... Little insert here. Oh, look. That even has a raven on it. Kind of a tight squeeze, though. I gotta admit. Let's get this back in. da 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 da, -da. Usually with an unboxing, I don't sit there putting <laughs> everything in the box. <laughs> well, yeah, I sort of do, I guess. Because then I say, okay, so we've got this and this. So we've got the cards. We've got the envelopes. We've got the rule book. And that is the Ravens of Three Sahasri. Taking a stab. Hey, it was better, better than yesterday when I was trying to pronounce the game. Hmm. Uh, designed by Kuro, and it is from Osprey Games, a division of Osprey Publishing. And I do want to point out that until December 15th, The Ravens, <laughs> for short, is on sale through Osprey. It's 30% off. So I believe the MSRP on this is 22? 22 or 24? But it is one of the titles that are on sale only through December 15th. So I'm going to do my best to make sure that uh, I get uh, a, re uh, a review of this done before then. So because uh, if it's a fun game, if it's a cool game, I want to make sure to get that info out to you so you can order it <laughs> and save some money. Okay, so next I've got the Lost expedition oh yeah oh yeah so don't need those for a minute <coughs> excuse me let me uh wet the old whistle for a sec ah, delicious oh hey i forgot to to mention um for the mailbag and i uh, i pointed out before by all means if any questions comments suggestions you know, anything, you can email me at mailbag at thegaminggang.com. Uh, I did get an email yesterday. Now off the top of my head, I can't remember the person's name. And they were asking if this coffee mug that I've got, which is not lovely, cat hair on the mug. Thanks a lot, Pinky. I can tell it's your your hair. They They were wondering, hey, isn't that a Game of Thrones coffee cup? And isn't it the Lannisters? Were you a bad guy? <laughs> it's like, yes, it is. It is actually a uh, Lannister coffee cup. And it's a big cup, as you can see, as I put it right up next to my face. Uh, funny story with this is uh, we go to San Diego Comic-Con as the press every year. And HBO always, uh, at least the past three years, they've, they've done a, a Game of Thrones. They call them installations. Kind of like artists, you know, an installation as opposed to an exhibit. But anyway, they're really cool no matter what they call it. And uh, the night before the convention starts, it's Wednesday night. Uh, it's like a preview night. Excuse me, sorry. Oh, see, that's what happens when you're drinking Diet Coke. You start getting all... Bleh. Anyway, uh, on the Wednesday night before the con kicks off, 
HBO usually has a, a, a media party and it's where they've got the installation for Game of Thrones. So we go last year and HBO always has like a swag bag for the press. A lot of companies do. Uh, but HBO just went like hog wild last year. Their swag bag was like $300 worth of stuff. There was this, there were, I've got uh, some figures that are up here in the back background that you obviously probably can't see. Uh, T-shirts, just, it was nuts. It was super cool. We were like, wow, HBO, you rock. I mean, HBO does rock, Game of Thrones rocks, but they really went all out. And of course, you know, there's little finger foods and booze and stuff like that. Cause you know, when you're the press, uh, all you gotta do is say free free drinks they come running they'll be there so anyway uh so yes person whose name i can't remember this is a lannister mug so on that note i'm going to take a sip i know you're sitting there thinking jeff are you ever going to take a look at the lost expedition of course i am i'm going to look at it right now the lost expedition i do know a little bit about this game or at least i know a little bit what it's based on so, uh, back in the day, there was an explorer named Percy Fawcett. And you may have heard of him if you've ever seen, uh, if you saw the recent movie, Lost City of Z. And there's a book that it's based on as well. Pretty, pretty interesting book. But they sort of make Percy Fawcett out to be like this great explorer. And he was trekking off to find the Lost City of Z which uh, I believe they refer to as El Dorado for the Lost Expedition, but I don't know, I'm, maybe my memory's not working right. I didn't think it was El Dorado that he thought he had found or he was going to find. But anyway, so uh, so the book and the movie kind of make him out to be this you know great heroic explorer. And on the flip side, a lot of historians basically say he was a bumbling idiot and... Um, he really wasn't some great explorer. I would think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. So anyway, so Percy Fawcett sets off to find El Dorado, Lost City of Z, whatever, Lost City of Zed. And uh, on his third try, his third expedition, he never returns. <laughs> so, see ya. Uh, the story is that um, because he was a bumbling idiot, he had not uh, brought enough supplies and provisions and things like that. And uh, he started to kind of um, live off the natives, which they didn't really appreciate too much. And uh, I guess uh, they got tired of him. And uh, I guess he was kind of rude doing that whole white man's burden thing. And uh, so they killed him. So they basically killed him. Uh, and his son and his son's best friend died too. They were never found. Although story is that they were already sick from malaria. So they... But uh, yeah, supposedly the natives, uh, native tribe killed Percy and uh, they may have ate him. I don't know. That's a story. So anyway, so the Lost Expedition, we already know Percy uh, has gone to meet his maker or at least he's never returned. This, this box is a little bit heavy too. So uh, you will notice that the camera kind of bounces around a little bit when I put it down. So uh, I better put the old... Uh, reading specs on for a second here see see what we got so the game is by pure sylvester Let's pull this up there legendary explorer percy fawcett marched deep into the amazon in search of el dorado he was never seen again your team is following in his footsteps but in searching for riches you must be careful not to lose the greatest treasure of all your life. Make the best of your food, your ammunition, and your health as you plunge deep into the jungle. Choose your path carefully to ensure you're ready for the pitfalls which may occur. Play solo or cooperatively to survive the expedition or play head to head to see who can find the lost city first. From award-winning designer Pierre Sylvester and acclaimed comic artist Garen Ewing, Sweet, a couple of names I can pronounce. 
The Lost Expedition is a game of hard choices on the road to El Dorado. The game is for one to five players, ages 14 and up, and plays in approximately 30 to 50 minutes. Obviously, probably depending on the number of players. So I have heard Lost Expedition is a challenging game. What did I call it? What did I say? A hard game to play? When I was talking about it the other day, I didn't talk about choosing words poorly. Uh, I do not have the understanding that it's a difficult game to learn or to understand. But I do believe that this is not an easy game to win, which is cool with me. I enjoy games that are challenging. I don't necessarily want a game that's going to be impossible to be able to win. But see, now look, I put it down and the camera kind of shook around a little bit. All right, get that plastic out of the way. All right, here we go. Let's dig on in. Does this uh, open like a book? It does. It kind of opens like a book. I was sitting there trying to grab the other side, and I'm wondering why won't this open? Also available from Osprey Games. There's some cool, cool stuff that I've noticed from Osprey Games. They've got, uh, here I go. I'm going to go off on a, another star cartel hmm. that one i wasn't familiar with uh escape from the aliens in outer space i i've seen i haven't seen up close but i am aware of it and uh odin's ravens i think odin's ravens was one of the first osprey games that came out uh so anyway i was gonna go off on a tangent and uh did not but i will now uh war gaming fans out there uh, I know I've got friends out there who are grognards or who, who like miniatures and stuff like that. The latest release from Osprey Games is a book. I know I did a news piece about Dracula's America, Shadows of the West, which looks super cool. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can maybe get a PDF for a review of that. I don't need the necessarily physical book. <coughs> anyway, so I know over the years, a lot of people have contacted myself at the gaming gang asking what I knew about Steve Jackson games and car wars and you know when they did the ogre kickstarter it was oh we're gonna redo car wars we're gonna redo car wars if we hit this you know pledge level which they did and all they really did is re-released kind of a revamped car wars that had already been out years before which was nowhere near as detailed or um, as customizable as the original Car Wars was. As clunky a game as that was back in the day. Still, anyway, so the new game from Osprey Games is called Gaslands. And it's got a real Car Wars feel to it. It's vehicular combat. And it just came out. I think it came out just a few days ago. I haven't. I haven't even gotten a, a news piece up. I was going to include it as a news piece, but I can't find any images for it. And I feel kind of stupid just, here's the cover. <laughs> Look at this cover for five minutes as I talk about it. But that looks pretty cool. So uh, folks out there who've been looking for what's going on with Car Wars, I don't know. I don't know why they email me asking anyway, just because we had talked about it a few times on the old podcast. All right, back to the game. Hey, but at least I was pitching something else for Osprey. So we've got a counter sheet here. So obviously I can see that we've got health, we got food, and we've got ammunition. Expedition, wow, oh, look at how well cut that is. It just popped right on out. Expedition leader, morning, and shall I take a guess? We flip it over and it says night. Oh, uh, okay, evening. I was close. So we've got these dual-sided tokens or counters as I always tend to call them so we've got that the rule book oh what are these oversized cards wow and it's got like a little little plastic holding a uh, little plastic storage tray in there oh, we got some designer notes contents components 
game overview. It says, in the Lost Expedition, you'll be leading a team of three explorers to follow the path of Percy Fawcett on the road to El Dorado. To win the game, simply get to the Lost City with one of your explorers still alive. You'll have to make the best use of your expertise and resources to survive as you head deeper into the jungle. Resources are represented by tokens. Expertise is represented by symbols on the cards. There are three types of each. Resources are food, ammunition, and health. Areas of expertise are the jungle, navigation, and camping. Uh, maybe another one should be good manners so that the natives don't kill you and possibly eat you. Okay, so we've got the overview. It talks about the adventure cards, card symbols. So it looks like uh, you, you'll run across these different, uh, probably like events, and you're going to have to uh, spend your resources, the path, the expedition. I like this. Advance, death. <laughs> we either move forward or die. There's some examples. Cooperative rules. This is one thing that I thought was pretty cool too. So not only can you play it solitaire, you can play it with other players and you're all working together. I would uh, take a stab that maybe you each get one of the explorers. I don't know. Maybe it's a, like a big team. Or you can also play, excuse me again, another cat hair flipping around. Uh, you can also play head to head to see who can get to the lost city. So we've got setup. We've got easy, normal, and hard. The goal we've got morning and then evening. Ending the round, ending the game. Hey, cool. Here's our solitaire rules. Nice. And the game end. Then we've got head-to-head -head rules. And then some clarifications. And a note on the explorers. It says, wow, all characters and events depicted in this game are entirely fictional. They are inspired by historical people and events. If you're interested in science and adventure at the turn of the last century, we encourage you to find out more about them. And then it tells you who these characters are supposed to represent. Look at that. Teddy Roosevelt, I could tell right away. Didn't even have to read, I could tell. That's Teddy, the bull moose. Uh, at, long after he was president though. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Teddy Roosevelt uh, went on an expedition. I don't remember, was it the, I don't, gosh, I'm trying to remember. Was it the Amazon? Was it Africa? Might've been the Amazon. Uh, and almost died. Hmm, well, how about that? All right, so we've got the different decks. We've got a couple of little explorer meeples, it looks like. Got a little baggie to put those counters and stuff in. All right, let's get that handy dandy hobby knife out again. One of the reasons why I use the hobby knife, you can tell, I'll give you an example here. These are almost kind of like, I don't want to say vacuum sealed, but the seal's pretty tight on them. And a lot of times you can't really catch that edge to get this open. And there's nothing worse than trying to take, I, I keep my fingernails really short. I don't like long fingernails. But um, what you'll find is, uh, you know, trying to get it with your nail or like a knife, just regular steak knife or something like that, you can really easily ding one of the cards or a few of the cards, and then it's like, oh man, no. All right, so we've got Bessie, Candido, Isabella. Taking a wild guess that these are probably, these icons here are their specialties, their expertise, I guess. So I'd say that's camping, exploration. We've got Roy. There's Teddy, Innes. Okay, so these are the, what we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. So I would take a stab that these are probably your six core explorers. You might be wrong. 
Don't know. Haven't played it. So we've got that. And it looks like we've got kind of these path cards. Aha! Oh, look at that. Look at that. How much you want to bet that's the Lost City? Looks like these are kind of get laid down. Eh, it looks like some could connect, some may not see. So, okay, for an example, like those two connect there. But, of course, these two don't. That river doesn't continue on that. But, uh, okay, so we've got these. How many of these did we have? Was that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah, there's nine of those. And the explorers. And this looks like these are sort of the uh, different events. So let me get this open here. There are a lot of these. Now, there might be more than one deck. Get off me, Plastic. Get off me. Okay, so it looks like these are... This looks like some player aids. Yep, sure enough. Got two player aids. Right there. That. And it looks as if these are all. Yep, they all have the same backing here. I'm not going to go through every single card, but let's take a quick peek. All right, so we got Crocodile. Man, I hate when that happens. Pounding Rain. Venomous Spider. Those are never, never, ever good. Hopefully, it's not a brown recluse. Infected Wound. Injury. And we can see there's all these icons up here. Uh, and they're different colors. So, as we can see there, that's kind of a yellow. And then this is kind of a, almost, I guess, a, like a rust color. I wonder if these are different ways that you can avoid this pitfall. Nightshade. Deadly Nightshade, obviously. Certain Outpost. Vantage Point. So maybe some of these... Uh, okay, so here we've got... See, we've got blue. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you actually gain those? Hmm. Monkey! 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 Just don't shock the monkey, Okay. Mudslide, leeches, ooh, yuck. <laughs> so there are 56, it looks like, of these cards. Take a quick peek here. And I'm gonna take a guess that these are in no random order. That is not a Jaguar you want. You might want the car, but you certainly don't want one of those. Thick fog. I believe what uh, what you might end up doing is you might actually have a uh, certain number of these cards that you're going to choose beforehand. And uh, so you'll have your challenges that you're going to face during that expedition. Obviously, I highly doubt you're going to go through this entire deck for a game that's supposed to last... Uh, 30 minutes. So then again, I might be completely wrong. I have not played this. I am going to bust this out to be honest with you. Uh, once I get today's news pieces up and uh, kind of tackle uh, what I might be covering a little bit tomorrow, I'm going to try to get a game of this in or at least start learning how to play it. Because uh, not only am I going to only do, you know, unboxings and then reviews, I want to bust out some how to play. Uh, videos as well here on the Daily Dope. But nothing that's going to be like, you know, takes you an hour <laughs> to sit through and watch me explain it. No, I, I'm sure nobody wants to see that. Okay, so we've got these cards here. We've got the Player Aid and we've got our Explorers as well as these kind of map cards. So they have numbers on the back. 
So we've got those. We've got our little meeples. I guess they were under there, weren't they? Put that bag in there. And the various tokens. The rules and our little advertisement for more cool stuff from Osprey Games. And that is what we find when we take everything from the Lost Expedition outside the box, as I used to like to say, because my unboxing videos were always called Outside the Box. It's so very cool. So stay tuned. I am certainly going to have more coverage of uh, both the Ravens of three and the lost expedition uh very shortly do have some other titles too uh from osprey that if you uh didn't catch yesterday's i think it was yesterday's i don't know these are all i haven't even done this a week and they're all kind of like one big long show now when just extends all the way out it's like 3d now anyway um i do have some other titles too i've got zoo ball I've got Samurai Gardener, and then the th third title I think was in, oh, uh, Shahrazad, Shahrazad I think is the title of it. Uh, looks like it's kind of an Arabian Nights kind of card game, or um, gosh, what was it? Uh, uh, whatever, you know, okay, but I'm pretty sure it's like an Arabian Nights card game. I think I want to say it's called Shah, Shahraz. Shah, Razad. It's not right in front of me. That's why I can't think of it off the top of my head. So anyway, that is all I've got for you today. I hope everyone's going to have a wonderful Tuesday. Keep in mind, if you enjoy the Gaming Gang or the Daily Dope, uh, I'm going to have a little link down below for uh, my Patreon, our Patreon, I should say. Uh, I'm not going to do like Twitch donations, stuff like that. It's just, I just... This just doesn't seem like a thing where I want to do, like, you know, little silly things popping up going, oh, Joe Blow is a follower now, or, you know, Frank subscribed, or I don't know. Anyway, but I did uh, promise that I would get a shout out to uh, someone who has watched, I believe, every one of these live streams, even the test ones, even the disastrous ones. Uh, Enroth. 186 over on YouTube. And thank you so much for the nice comments that you've tossed out. Uh, oh, a few nice words go a long way to have people like me continue to bring you reviews and news and, and things like that. So uh, if you are not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for the latest in news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Come on, you know the drill by now. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. I am Jeff McAleer. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you tomorrow.